All right, so let's begin. So first, I have to give you some legalese uh, disclaimer for this webinar. You agree by participating in this webinar that the information presented does not constitute legal advice and in, is being presented for informational purposes only. You also agree that no attorney-client relationship is established or assumed by participating in this webinar and that the information or suggestions presented in this broad overview may not apply to your specific circumstances. So with that, we can begin. Again, my name is Ashley Atkins. I am an associate here at the Law Offices of Peter Brewer. I'm in my third year of practice here, and I've dealt with quite a few partition actions and have learned a lot along the way. So I wanted to give you an overview of how they work, uh, the little nuances involved in them, and to see if I can help broaden your horizon on partition actions. So first, uh, just to be able to file a partition action, you have to be a co-owner. And so I'm going to go over the basics of co-ownership in California. So first, how do you become a co-owner? This can happen either through inheritance when uh, a mom or dad or grandpa puts in their trust that certain beneficiaries will get the property. Usually it's more than one, uh, and, th and then you would become a co-owner. Two, you buy the property together, husband and wife, brother, sister. Um, that's a good way to become co-owners. Also, the property can be gifted to you. Um, sometimes when people get married or a mom will transfer a portion of her interest in the property to her son or daughter, that's another way to become co-owner. Uh, second, I put listed on most recent deed because in order to be a co-owner, validly, you have to be on the most recent deed. And any way you become a co-owner, either by inheritance, you buy the property, or you're gifted it, you will be on the most recent deed, either if that's grant deed, quick claim deed, what have you, whatever applies in your particular situation. So next, what rights do you have as a co-owner? So these, this list isn't inclusive of all the rights you have. I did the rights that are most pertinent to partition actions. And so first, as a co-owner, you have a right to possess and use the property. What does that mean? That means any co-owner can live in the property or use it in a legal manner. Um, this usually is a cause for dispute because people don't agree when they're co-owners. At some point, one co-owner wants to live in the property, one wants to rent it out. So this right is usually disputed um, if it comes to partition actions. Second, you have a right to collect rent. So if you rent it to a third party tenant, the other co-owners have a right to their proportional share of that rent. So if there's four owners, um, each co-owner will be entitled to one quarter of the rent. And lastly, as a co-owner, you have a right to force a sale or a right to force division. And so any co-owner can, what we call, partition the property. Uh, there's some exclusions to this. There's, there's only a few. One of those is that you can waive your right to force a division. Sometimes in a trust we've seen where uh, the beneficiary inherits the property contingent on the fact that they can't sell it for a certain amount of time. Usually that's five years, ten years. So during that time period they cannot divide the property or at least their interest. Uh, second, when property is held as community property, this is held for family courts or divorce courts, excuse me, just depending on what stage you are in the division, um, courts won't allow partition for property held and community property. And that's typically just husband and wife. Next, uh, now that we've talked about how you co-own a property and what rights you have, we can get into the heart of partition actions. So first, who can seek it? Same as I mentioned before, any co-owner, regardless of their interest, can seek uh, partition action. And that's under CCP 872-210 if you want to learn more about it. Um, so for instance, me and you buy a property, I own 95%, you own 5%. You have a right to partition even though you're a minority owner. Uh, it doesn't matter what share you have, you have that right. I think that's pretty powerful. Second. What's the jurisdiction for the lawsuit? So in a lot of cases where property is inherited, um, the beneficiaries are scattered all over the state or even the country. 
And so some co-owners have a hard time deciding where to file the partition action, but the court will always go to where the property is located. It's a central position. Um, it's the subject of a lawsuit, and that's where you file suit. Next, uh, methods of partition. How is this property going to be divided? And this can be of some dispute, but ultimately uh, it's more common sense, if anything. The first one is partition in kind. Um, this is under 873.210 of the Code of Civil Procedure. Um, if you look at 872 through about 879 or so, those are most of the codes on partition actions. Um, you can learn pretty much everything you need to know, at least from the onset. So it's, it's very helpful to actually look at the code, but I'll give a brief overview of the methods just so you have an idea of what's possible. So first, partition in kind. This is when you physically divide the land. And it's just as it sounds. So a residential property, say in Palo Alto, you have a two-bedroom house. It, it doesn't make sense to divide that physically because you'd have one co-owner on one half of the house and the other on the, on the other side. It doesn't make sense. And so in that case, you would sell the property. But for some ranches or large acreage properties, partition in kind works. Um, they'll divide it in an equitable way, proportional to your interest. That is a solution that the court will give parties that are in a partition action. Second, partition by appraisal. Uh, this one's very common with inherited properties, also um, brother or sister owning it as co-owners. Um, this type of division requires agreement by the parties. And so if the party, one party can't afford the property or wants to sell the property, the other co-owners can agree to buy them out. Again, all parties have to agree. And if this ever happens, the judge will require an appraisal uh, by the co-owners. And then the ones that are buying out the proportional interest, they pay that price. And so that's the second way. And third, the most common way and really the main ones I've seen are par partitioned by sale. Um, this is when one co-owner forces the sale of the property. This makes the most sense for residential properties. That's usually the properties in dispute. And so what happens is the court can't divide the property, and so the property is listed and sold. And um, this is the most common way that we see. Next, why do people partition the property? Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but I've listed the most common ones that we see where people just don't get along. Um, typically, when one co-owner occupies the property, the other co-owner or co-owners, co excuse me, uh, aren't happy about that, or they rather rent the property, what have you. In that case, the co-owners that aren't happy will file for a partition and sell the property. This isn't always fair to the co-owner that's occupying the property, but that's just the way the law is set up. Second, relief from mortgage. Again, you see a trend with inherited properties. This is a reason to file for a partition. So a grandson or grandchild, one of them, uh, the co-owners, they can't afford to pay for the mortgage if there's a mortgage outstanding when the owner dies. Um, so they have to file for partition, or in this case, the other owner can buy them out and you get an appraisal. Uh, so that's another reason to file for partition or the reason why people do. Uh, the last two, failure to maintain and relief from management, this is when all or one of the co-owners either can't afford to maintain the property or they simply just don't want to deal with it if it's up in Reading or somewhere far where you can't physically maintain it. One co-owner will just say, hey, I want to sell it and get the cash. So that's another reason. Like I said, an example scenario would be when a property is inherited by multiple beneficiaries. Uh, one of the children won't agree. It's usually just one that's difficult. Um, you know, they don't have a job, they don't have any financial means, and so they, they want the cash now when they inherit it. And the, even if the co-owners don't agree or, you know, they fight it, there's no defense to it. That one beneficiary can file for partition and get their money, uh, so to speak. And so that's one of the most common examples we have come through the door where uh, we do have to work with trust attorneys quite a bit, and we do. Um, but the main focus of the case would be the partition, and that's one of the most common causes. 
So now that we've talked about the basics and how to partition property and why people do it, we could talk about actually filing it in the court. So first, <clears throat> before you do anything, uh, we really recommend that you determine who's on title. Our firm typically gets a litigation guarantee, and this can run you anywhere from four to five hundred dollars. Uh, we can get it from anyone from Old Republic Title Company to First American Title Company. Any one of those usually is a safe bet. And what they do is they insure the property for who's on title. And this is important for, I could list a hundred reasons, but the main ones are that if you're an attorney, you can advise your client that they actually have a right to partition this property. You don't want to draft a complaint, go to court, file it, and your client's not even on title. So this covers you and your client to ensure, one, do they have a right to do this, and two, who do you need to serve in order to validly file the complaint? And then next, so you've found out that you have the ability to file for partition, so now you need to draft the complaint. So what goes in the complaint? I gave a brief overview of the elements that are required if you want a full list and or if you're actually drafting a complaint for partition right now, uh, 872.210 of the Code of Civil Procedure is the place to look. They list anything and everything that's required depending on the type of property, so that's important. But the main ones are you have to li list the property de description, and this goes back to the litigation guarantee where that will have the property description and you'll know that that is accurate. So it's important to get that before you draft the complaint. Second, who's on title. Again, this comes in handy. Um, as you can see, the litigation guarantee, you have to fork out some cash in the beginning, but it really makes the whole process a lot easier. Uh, and third, how do you want the property divided? So part of your complaint will be describing to the judge about the property, why a certain method is appropriate. So if you own a huge ranch, tell the judge, hey, this can be divided. There's a road in between. Um, partition in kind is the right method or partition by sale. You have to give the judge some facts on why that method works and then they rule on that or the parties agree. So you draft the complaint. Next step is filing it. Uh, like I said, the correct court to file it in is where the property is located. So if you have a Palo Alto home and you're filing suit for partition, you would need to file it in Santa Clara County, and that's located in San Jose. But you can find that information online for any county in California. You just have to know where the property is located. So you file your complaint with the court, and the next step is you have to serve all of the co-owners of the property. And the common thread that you've probably seen is the litigation guarantee tells you who those people are, who's on title, who needs to be served. And just like with any other civil complaint, it has to be served pursuant to the rules of service of process. And I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because there's certain caveats to that. You could do service by publication. There, there's a bunch of ways, but the main ones, as most people know, are personal service and substitute service. So you have to comply with that, and you have to make sure you serve everyone on title, because if you don't, then technically your complaint's not valid, and not everyone's on notice, and you're likely to get denied. Also, when you send your process server, or you physically go down to file your complaint, you want to bring what is called a Liz Pendens, or a Notice of Pendency. And what this document does is you record it on title for the property, and it tells basically the world that, hey, you can't buy this property, it's on, it's in litigation, um, and it prevents one of the co-owners spitefully going out, listing the property and selling it behind your back or deeding it away to someone. Um, typically, if you're a buyer and you go to purchase a property um, in order to get a mortgage, they have to, you have to get insurance from the title company. If there's a list pendants on the property, you record it timely, then the mortgage company is not going to administer a loan. So it's very important you get this recorded. And it's a great tool to just put everything on hold while you're figuring out the lawsuit. Next. So we figured out, all right, you get your case on file. 
how does the court look at these cases? So I'm going to go over how the judge does and then what happens even after the judge rules. So first, after you file your lawsuit, the most common step after that is to head to ADR. Um, ADR means Alternative Dispute Resolution. If you've been in a lawsuit, I'm sure you've heard it a million times. Um, mediation is probably the best form for partition actions. Um, just because the method that you conduct a mediation with a neutral or a mediator is the same way that the property is divided. Once the judgment is administered, a referee, which I'll talk about later, is appointed and they mediate the sale. And so this is probably the best way to go about resolving the case before trial. And I really recommend it and I'll, I'll talk about that later on. Um, Obviously, it saves a lot on trial costs and attorney's fees. As I said, there's no defense to these partition actions. So going to trial doesn't really make sense in this case. And you're really just blowing your money. And if you're trying to advise your clients to settle or go to mediation and do it productively, you can tell them whatever money they spend going to trial, it's just going to come away from the proceeds of the sale. And so they can get more money if everyone agrees. So there's some incentive there for everyone to cooperate, but that's not always the case. Um, what the mediator does in that instance is they do the same thing that the judge would do if you did go to trial. And so it's it's similar to sports or you know football, baseball, fighting, whatever the case may be, whatever you like. Um, don't leave it up to the judges or don't leave it up to the ref. And so if you go to trial, you risk the, the point there being that the judge gets to pick all the terms. They get to pick the realtor. They get to pick how it's divided. They get to pick art, the price, the referee. And so if you agree with the co-owners on this at mediation, you have some say in what happens. And so I highly recommend that these kind of cases get settled in mediation just because your clients have more control. If you're a client, then you actually get to pick the terms, which you should be able to since you're a property owner. Um, if the parties do settle at mediation, what would happen is either the plaintiff, usually the plaintiff or the defendant, you'll draft a stipulated interlocutory judgment and the judge signs that. And what that does is the judgment, which is stipulated, it dictates the sale. So it has the terms of the transaction. Sometimes they pick the realtor, the referee, and so on, how, how everyone gets paid and etc. So. If you don't settle at mediation, you go to trial. And so it's essentially the same thing as mediation, but the judge decides the terms we, that the mediator would decide. And so that includes who owns what, the manner of division, uh, liens to be paid, encumbrances, and also they appoint a referee, which um, is standard for partition actions. So next, what do people fight over? Um, it's pretty broad, uh, as you can imagine, like most lawsuits. But the most common disputes on why people don't settle, uh, I've listed them here and go over them for a little bit. Uh, dispute the reason for partition. So the method or manner of division is usually argued about. Um, so one of the co-owners wants to keep the property uh, and not have it sold, and they lose complete possession of it. That's a, that's a reason. They fight over the appraisal, it's not accurate, or they don't like that appraiser. So that causes dispute on the value. There's a bunch of things that could um, people can argue about on that. But again, it's best to try to agree um, for everyone. You maximize your profit or maximize what you get out of the action. Second, they dispute the referee. Either they don't think he's effective, he or she, um, He's not responsive. It's similar to a client's dissatisfaction with their attorney. If they're not returning emails. They're not pushing the transaction along. All these things where they can go to the court and say, hey, this guy isn't doing his job. And that's a, that's a cause for dispute. And lastly, they dispute ownership. Uh, if you are a plaintiff and you file for, for a partition, one of the co-owners can cross-complain against you for a quiet title action and say, hey, you're not on title, I own this property, or, or so on, and they can kind of disrupt the flow of this process. So that's another reason for dispute. Next, using referee, as I mentioned. 
in mediation and if you go to trial, a referee is usually appointed because like I said, most of these cases are partitioned by a sale. And so once the judge rules or once the parties stipulate, there has to be someone to mitigate any issues that come up during the transaction, and this is the referee's job. So we'll talk about his duties and, and what he's able to do. So first, who gets selected? Like I said, if, if you're a co-owner and you want control over who the referee is, who plays a fairly large part, you want to try to stipulate to this, which means you agree. Or alternatively, the judge will appoint one. And anybody can be a referee, or just about anybody. And I've listed some people that aren't allowed, and that's clerk, any co-owner, obviously, or anyone associated with the judge that's on the case. Um, typically, I've seen retired realtors or brokers, uh, experienced real estate attorney, Anyone really, a retired judge, it's similar to mediation. If you've ever been to mediation, it's the same candidates that are mediators, people that have seen these deals, they know what to do, they can anticipate what to do next and, and move the transaction along. So what can they do? Um, well, first, they have a fiduciary duty to the parties. So no matter what the referee decides to do ultimately, which they can do anything, as you can see, they have to do what's in the best interest of the parties Typically, the judgment or the stipulated judgment will say that, um, that the referee is supposed to benefit the parties. You know, they're supposed to get the most amount of money or the best deal, et cetera. So they need to keep that in mind. Even when they're running the show, they have to keep the parties in mind. Second, like I said, they have broad powers. Uh, CCP 873-060, you might want to check that section out. It says specifically that a referee can do any acts necessary under the judgment, and then it goes on to say enforce the sale or enforce the division. And so to me, when I first started dealing with this, I was like, wow, anything really? I, I thought it was a little crazy, um, but it, it's true. There's some instances where if a referee wants to do something drastic or out of the norm, uh, they have the ability to go back to the judge with, with a motion or a report. They ca sometimes call it a referee report, asking the judge for some guidance, like, hey, is this okay? Does this make sense? And that's okay, too. But typically, they can do anything. And we'll go over some of the things that uh, they have the power to do next. So for partition by sale, the referee's powers are probably the most broad. And these include, they can enter into listing agreements, they can sign transaction documents, um, evict tenants. I've even seen cases where uh, one co-owner is occupying the property, like we mentioned, and they won't leave after the close of escrow. And so the referee has a duty to get them out. And sometimes they'll have to hire an eviction attorney to get it done. Um, my view on the referee is they have a duty to be adaptable to the situation. So whatever comes up, you have to handle it. Um, and Peter here in our firm actually has been a referee before, and that's where I've seen kind of the nuances. We actually had a really difficult transaction in that case, and he was able to adapt and adjust. And I think that's important. Um, that was just one example that I saw, and I've seen it in personal partition cases where we had a referee where you know, they have to think outside the box. That's very important. Um, like I said, they can do anything. They can determine the cost of the listing and showing the property, uh, sale price. So typically what a referee will do is they'll list the property with a realtor and you'll, you'll start getting all these offers back. And um, what they'll do is they'll look at each offer and decide which one of these is best for the parties. And that might not always be you know, the all cash offer or contingent offer, it, it really depends. So they have to be experienced in knowing uh, what the best offer is. And again, if the parties don't decide or the judge doesn't nominate one, they can pick a realtor. Uh, this is important. Sometimes what the referee will do to involve the co-owners is they'll send the co-owners three different realtors and let them pick. If they don't pick, obviously, um, they get to pick outright. But that's a good way to do it. And again, their main duty is just to resolve disputes that come up. Because even when the case is over, there's still going to be little uh, gripes here and there that come up. Again, 
So partition referee uh, for attorney's fees and accounting. So if you do go and file a partition action as an attorney for your client who's a co who should be a co-owner like we talked about, um, attorney's fees are tricky in these cases. What a judge will do, there's actually a California case, Lynn v. Jane from 2012, they will administer attorney's fees, if at all, to the party that was most prejudiced by the case. Typically, that's the plaintiff. If they're having to go out of their way to file a partition action uh, to get what they want, perhaps they're the most prejudiced, or maybe the person filing is the most difficult and is breaking up the norm, and the other owners want to keep the property and rent it out. Um, it's interesting to me that the judge has discretion to give attorney's fees to either side. Typically, attorney's fees are statutory or contractual um, in a lot of CAR or PRDS forms. If you violate that, that contract, then attorney's fee, you know, the losing party has to pay attorney's fees and so on. So this, this instance is it's pretty unique and it's something to consider both as a client as, and as an attorney because um, your client can be put in a bad spot if they're being unreasonable. And then, how do referees get paid? And, and a lot of people that want to be a referee or have been are concerned about that, um, but the judge obviously allots for it. Typically what happens in the stipulated judgment or the judgment from trial, they'll say in there uh, the referee that was nominated, their hourly rate, when will they be paid, how will they be paid. Mostly what I've seen is that referees are paid at the end of the transaction and whatever fees they build are taken away from the proceeds. This is probably the safest way because we know where the money is coming from. The co-owners that didn't file suit don't have to fork over the money ahead of time. It's probably the most efficient way to do it. Um, even sometimes attorneys that are representing co-owners do this. They'll say, hey, you don't owe any attorney's fees until the sale is completed. This is risky, obviously, if you're an attorney. Uh, if you're a client, it's the best way because you're able to get legal help and use the property as leverage for that because you know it's going to sell eventually um, and you just get a little bit less money. This is another reason why it's so important to resolve these disputes early on because the more fees that are spent on the referee, your own attorney, and fighting all over little things can really reduce the amount you get from the sale. Um, I try to remind our clients about that. Um, it's Trust me, I'd rather go to trial. It's better for our firm. I get more experience, but it's not about that. Ultimately, it's about the client and what's best for the co-owners. You know, the referee has a fiduciary duty. So do, so do we as attorneys. And it's really better if they resolve the disputes from the onset. And then lastly, <clears throat> I've seen issues with this. Uh, it is the last point, but not the least important, is reporting back to court. So for this, once everything's said and done, as for closes, you can kind of like sit back, you think, and everything's done. Not the case. Um, what the referee has to do is they have to file a motion with the court, get a hearing date, and they have to go back to the court to confirm the sale. So you, the referee will write a report. This is what the property sold for. This is who the realtor was. These are the terms so on and so forth, and the judge has to confirm it. They have the ultimate power, they approve everything, and so it's important to disclose to potential buyers that, hey, even after this case is over, the referee has to go back to the court and confirm the sale. Everything can fall through due to the judge. It, again, this is very unlikely. Uh, I can see this maybe happening if the buyer is someone that one of the co-owners knows or there's some bias there. Um, but typically, the judge is not going to disrupt something that large. Uh, but it's something that you, you should disclose to the buyers. Um, if you're a realtor, you're watching this, or even a client uh, that's going to be selling the property or referee, make sure you tell them that. Also, another thing that needs to be disclosed is that the co-owners have the ability to appeal. I believe that from when the judge administers the judgment, you have 60 days to give notice of appeal. So if the transaction closes before that 60 days is completed, then arguably one of the co-owners can appeal and 
cause a whole other disruption. So if you're a buyer, you're thinking about buying a property that's in partition, uh, be mindful of that. And also a seller, referee, realtor, make sure you disclose that. And so no one's caught off guard and you don't end up in another lawsuit. That's the last thing that anyone wants. And so that completes um, the basics of partition. And again, um, as a side note, to make sure you check out our website. Uh, our marketing director, Clayton Dodds, has redesigned it. It's really great. We have a lot of stuff on partitions on there. Also, you can register for the event next week with Simon Offered on easements. Um, and now I'll open up the forum for some questions. Um, so let me see what questions we have from you guys. Let's see. Can you become a co-owner by purchasing a joint tenant's interest? Oh, great question. Um, so if I'll give an example. That's the best way to explain it usually. Uh, two people own a property in joint tenancy. Typically, um, it's pretty common with grant deeds. And what can happen is each one of those co-owners that owns the property in joint tenancy can break up that agreement and they can sell their interest to another buyer. But what would happen, you would ask, well, what happens to that other co-owner that owned it in joint tenancy? Well, that joint tenancy is broken up and then now 99% of the time they're tenants in common. Unless the new owner and the prior owner agree to form a new joint tenancy, but typically any joint tenant can break up that joint tenancy and when they do, the ownership changes to tenancy in common. So that's a great question. So next question, if I decide to sell my one-third share of the property, do I still need to file a partition or any forms with the court? Um, well, first it depends how you own the property. Uh, community property may be a little bit different, but you can certainly sell your individual share. Again, um, that may cause some issues with your other co-owners. They might not want to be co-owners with someone they don't know or some random buyer, and then they might try to partition the property. Um, but as long as there's no waiver of your right to sell your interest through a trust or some agreement, you can certainly sell your own interest. But if you want to sell the whole property or divide the whole property, of course, you would have to file for partition. Next question, can the referee be the broker? Uh, arguably, I would not do that. I would keep things separate. Um, the referee is just like it sounds, a referee. So, for example, um, if you're playing a football game and you have a referee, uh, wouldn't it make sense to have, be the, have the quarterback and the referee be the same person because he's refing the quarterback's play and the quarterback can't ref his own play. So if that makes sense, you want to keep them separate and have one person monitoring the sale and one person conducting it. And so I, I, I wouldn't recommend that for sure. Is mediation binding? So in almost no instances in mediation binding unless the parties agree to that. Uh, if you've ever been to a mediation, you sit down in the room with the mediator, usually all together. They try to get everyone together, even if you don't agree. And the mediator will sit there and tell you, hey, um, whatever you say here is confidential. It can't be used in court, blah, blah, blah. And this encourages candidness by the parties. The mediator wants the parties to say stuff they might not say if they are on the record. And so it encourages settlement. But whatever you do or whatever you decide on, whatever agreement you get to in mediation, if it falls through, uh, it's not binding. It's totally voluntary. There's other forms of ADR depending on your situation, but mediation is the most common, but it, it, you're not bound to it, certainly not. Next question. Does the judge look for other buyers like an auction sale? So again, this is why it's important to settle because if you mediate the dispute and you pick a referee and pick a realtor, then you can almost guarantee that your property will be listed. Uh, this typically gets a higher price. There are auction sales. This is when the parties won't agree at all. Um, it, it could be a rundown property or they can't agree on a realtor, referee, and so the judge just says, forget it. I'm going to hire someone to go out on the court, 
court steps and then to sell it at an auction. This is not great for your clients or if you're an attorney, you have to advise your clients to avoid this because if you ever bought a property from auction or been to one at the court, the price is very low. And so it, it's not in the best interest of the parties, but the judge won't do it if they're very frustrated. Question, next question. Let's say one co-owner wants to buy out the other, partition by appraisal. Sounds like if the other co-owner wants partition by sale, they get what they want. True? And that's exactly right. And, and like I said prior, partition by appraisal requires agreement by everyone. So you're essentially going to mediation and stipulating to the terms. If the terms include a buyout, if one of the co-owners are capable of that, then that's the perfect resolution because you know who's getting the property, you're not selling it to a random buyer, and the person that sued for a partition in the beginning gets the money, which is what they wanted from the get-go, so everyone's happy. So partition by appraisal is really the best solution, in my opinion. Next question. When entering into a co co-ownership, is it possible to remove the ability to take certain partition action? If all parties agree, would it be possible to remove the ability for either owner to force a sale unless agreed by all parties? Um, short answer, I would say no. Like I said, there are certain waivers. Um, I've done certain deeds of trust and promissory notes where uh, an uncle or grand grandfather deeded his property to his niece or, or granddaughter and we condition that granting on the fact that she wouldn't go and sell it in say 10 years and so you can condition someone's right to partition uh, but a, a separate agreement I would have to research that certainly but my first answer is no you can't take away their right unless there's some exception one of the, the first one I, I talked about was waiver by way of trust or deed of trust separate agreement and then community property interests is, is another exception where they're not allowed to do a partition action. So whether you can do that agreement, um, I'm not quite certain on that. I, I think it would work. I uh, just want to be careful from people contracting out of something they're legally allowed to do. There would have to be consideration and other terms involved to make it a valid agreement. So next question. Is there a way to remove co-owners from the title without causing the property be, to be reassessed by the county and the property tax increase? So that's a question for our one of our most senior attorneys, Charles Bernitsky. He's our tax guy. Uh, in real estate law, either you're all in with the tax law or not at all. Um, I don't do a lot of tax work, but I, I am aware of the reassessment issues and document documentary transfer tax. Um, so I do a lot of deeds and we're transferring interest, you know, one quarter interest or one third. There's certain ex exclusions to that that can prevent you from being reassessed. If you know anything about that, it's typically parent to child, spousal transfer, uh, no change in interest transfer. There's a bunch. But that's the question that I would need to see a specific deed and property to see if you would have any exclusions. That's a little specific for this type of question. Next question. What is the difference between a litigation guarantee and a condition of title? So condition of title, um, from my understanding, is not as thorough. Uh, you have a title report, which is the most extensive one, obviously. It costs similar $500 or so. Condition of title, uh, I believe the title company just looks up who's what's the most current deed, but they're not insuring that document. The litigation guarantee is just like it sounds. They're guaranteeing if you go and file a partition action that you actually have a right to do it. Um, it's very similar to a title report, except it's meant for litigation. And so while condition and title um, document is great, it, it's not the best. Uh, do either a litigation guarantee or a title report to spend that extra money and, and make sure that it's legit. Next question, do partition actions always involve referee? Can co-owners choose their own realtor without referee involved? Um, it depends on how far the parties get in settling the case or resolving it. <clears throat> Obviously, if, if it goes to trial, if it really gets to that 
the judge isn't going to trust the parties to not have a referee. They're, the judge is going to say, hey, you guys couldn't even agree to sell this before court, even though there's no defense. You still can't agree. You have to have a referee to monitor this transaction. If you settle as soon as someone files and you agree on a, on a method of sale, arguably the judge can say, hey, it's not necessary in this instance. I think the judge has discretion to do that. Uh, there's no statutory way to avoid having a referee. Typically, in a partition by sale, you need one, though, however, unless your attorney is very proactive in confirming the transaction. Because like I said, he has to go back after the close of escrow and confirm the sale. Next question. If the property is held in a trust or an FLP, um, does this process still apply? That's the question for a trust attorney. I, I've actually read a lot of trusts recently, and they're very unique in nature. We actually have a trust attorney downstairs. Her name's Janet Brewer. No relation to Peter, um, just a coincidence. They're not related or married. Actually, they're one day apart, which is funny. But she, did, she does estate planning and trust, and uh, this would be a question that I would have to go ask her about. Um, sometimes a trust will preclude division and so you would have to go and get a trust attorney's opinion on if I file suit for partition would that violate the trust and so sorry I couldn't answer that in more depth but uh, we have to use our resources when we need to and that would be a question where I would have to go downstairs. There are two co-owners if one co-owner wants partition by sale and the other co-owner wants partition by appraisal there is no defen defense against the owner who wants partition by sale. Well. I, uh, I'll keep reiterating the biggest point about partitions is that there has to be an agreement for appraisal because arguably, one, the co-owner that sued has to be willing to sell his interest to the co-owners. He might not want them to buy him out. He might say, hey, no, I don't want you guys to get my share. Or two, the other co-owners might not be able to buy his share. And so while one side wants partition by appraisal, it doesn't matter. All the co-owners have to want it and have to be able to do it. Otherwise, partition by sale is the default if the property can't be physically divided. So one, usually the parties address, is this a property that can be divided physically? If not, all right, it's going to be sold. A caveat to that is, okay, can the parties agree? And then there may be some kind of buyout. But that it typically, typically comes with settlement. <clears throat> okay, last question. Have there been any decisions by the court that have surprised you regarding partition actions, like rejecting a partition action or rejecting the sale? So I'll, I'll answer that in two parts. First one, I've actually seen a case where a judge voided the sale, and that's why I brought up that example where one co-owner was in cahoots with the buyer that ended up buying the property, and he got a little bit of a better deal than he should have, which cut the other co-owners out of the maximum amount of proceeds and so um, I believe one of the co-owners ended up appealing and the judge said hey that this wasn't what my order said or the judgment um, and that also comes down to the referee the referee has to make sure that it's fair and equitable and so that's a re that's a surprising case to me also the attorney's fee provision um, it's not applicable applicable in these cases. Like I said, there's a court case in 2012 that actually permitted the judge to give attorney's fees to anyone. Um, if you've ever been involved in litigation or trial, you know how detrimental that could be to be surprised by attorney's fees at the end. And here, it's not really predictable. Uh, the judge is going to look at the totality of the circumstances and say, hey, you made this case difficult or this person was prejudiced by you so on and so forth, and he'll award attorney's fees, uh, I believe is Lin V. Jang, 2012 case, and, and that was pretty monumental. <clears throat> and so with that, uh, we're going to close this webinar. I thank you so much for joining us. Um, one last reminder, we have another event next week about easements. Uh, super interesting. Our senior attorney, Simon Offord, is very knowledgeable. Um, he has anywhere from five to ten cases at a time every day on easement, so it's definitely something to check out. Um, again, check out our website, and we will send you a link with the slides once this is all said and done. Thank you.